Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. I watch from behind the fence. I watch them herd a mass of people into the square, old people and little children, pregnant women, women with infants, and they did beat them, they did kick them, they did shove them, they did curse at them. And this one terrified mother turns to Rokita, who was there, he was the boss of the whole thing, and she goes, please, please, please be careful of my baby. And Rokita says, you're afraid the baby might get hurt? I can solve your problem. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Then he grabbed the baby from out of the mother's arms. He held the baby by the legs over his head and he crushed the baby's brains out on the cobblestone. Then he shoot the mother. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. I am so happy. We are joined today by my college friend, the great actress Tova Feldshu, who's giving a stunning performance in Irina's Vow on Broadway. And my Facebook friend, Adam Feldman, drama critic of Time Out New York. And they are having a dispute. Are we having a dispute? I, I wouldn't Are you having a dispute? I didn't know. So, I, I, I so just been brought into it. We just it. met. We only just met. He's <laughs> mad for me. He thinks I'm I, his mother. I do. <laughs> this is the irony. Yes. This is the irony. Is I am actually, boy. I am a Tova fan of long standing. But, but Adam, you wrote a review about Tova's play. Right, tell them what the play's about. Irena's Vow is a, is a true story about Irena Gutopdijk, a Polish Catholic rescuer during World War II who, as an ordinary 18-year-old kid, did extraordinary things under extraordinary circumstances. In this case, she hid 12 Jewish adults and one infant boy in the cellar of the highest-ranking German officer of Tarnopol, then Poland, now the Ukraine. And they all survived, lived to tell the tale, and her plaque is next to Otto Schindler's on the Avenue of the Righteous at Yad Vashem. Uh, because they have 13 corroborating testimonies. That I've seen it. She was their angel. That's what and she... you have the temerity, I have the temerity. to attack this story well, in this Well, it play? is my job. I'm not attacking the story. the story. The story is genuinely inspirational, and it's based on, this play is based on a memoir that uh, Ms. Uh, Updike right. wrote, um, which I have read. Um, my problem is with the way that this story has been treated. I didn't feel that the adaptation and the production did justice to the story. The story itself is very inspirational and interesting, and I felt oddly um, unimpressed with the story itself leaving the theater. Uh, the way that it's written and the way that it's staged left me feeling uh, disbelief at the end of the play. Left me feeling, huh, I'm not sure I believed that story. Um, it left me with a feeling of, of phoniness, which I think for a Holocaust drama is a very dangerous thing to what instill is, What in is your audience. reaction to that, Tova? Well, no, no, I need specifics. Well, for, well, for <laughs> He's very, first of all, let, yes. let's just get to very important things. My mother rates parts by how I look. <laughs> so as she says, Tova, I rate parts by how you look. Golda Meir was a zero. <laughs> <laughs> Tova looks fantastic in this show. Let's get this right on the table. She looks terrific and in the show. She, she goes look, from being, th what? 17 to 72. Pretty yeah, much. 17 to 72. But well, I understand. No, but here's an example. In the summary that you just gave, um, you said that Irena Gudopdijk hid 12 adults and one infant child in this basement. Yes, but in yeah. fact, in real life, she did not hide an infant child. There was a pregnant woman in the basement, but uh, that woman did not give birth until after she was out of hiding. Uh, and, no, no, and, no, no, and no. What, she gave birth in the forest. In the forest, but not in while she was in hiding. On right. safe not house. while she was hiding with this with this woman and and the Nazi officer that she was working for. Uh, so there's an entire scene that's been invented where this woman gives birth and her birth cries are disguised by Irena by turning up the volume very loudly on a Wagner recording. Um, it's a dramatic scene, but it's one that doesn't ring true. And I went back after the show to the memoir to find this scene, and I found, in fact that it wasn't there. But what, what's the problem? So he took, took exception with Dan Gordon melding, melding the memory. Dan Gordon, you, who wrote the play. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, I surely didn't write the scene. I just say the lines yes, and try, so, I hope yeah. they, they ring true, of course. 
and that was the melded memory. But let us say this. The woman did get pregnant in the basement. Mm -hmm. They didn't know they were going to be l l out of that house. She could well have given birth to the baby exactly in the house. Exactly right. And the abortion scene did happen, where they asked her to kill this baby, to go get the tools for an abortion. And Irena did plead for the life of this child. And in the end, she did get the abortion stuff. And in the end, they did get them out of the cellar into this supposedly safe house. They lived with another Christian family in the woods where Roman, in fact, was born. And he came to your play. <clears throat> right. He came he to came my to play on, on yeah, opening that, that night. That's but, but but just, but just one example. For dramatic purposes, I mean, is a, a playwright is not a historian. No, that's is a yeah. playwright not allowed to take question. from history and create a dramatic experience for, that, for the play? My personal feeling is that when you're talking about the Holocaust, the bar is higher. And especially recently, when there have been a number of scandals involving false Holocaust memoirs, which play right into the hands of anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers, uh, I think we have to be extra careful. So, when do you we're follow Schindler's what purport List? To be true stories, yeah. Um, and uh, and when we present them in ways that are not uh, that don't seem truthful to me. So, Adam, do you follow Schindler's List, which was riddled with inaccuracies? You know, I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on that one. I can't I can't go into. You're taking one Holocaust show by no, but by I will say time. what I will say also. Is it's not just the liberties that were taken; it's also, unfortunately, the 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 style in which it, it's the, it's been written and the professionalism with which it's been staged. I think that there are a lot of things about the show be, beyond the liberties that are taken that that don't make it seem real to me. And I think that talk, that's talk one to reason. me because I, I I would always hope as an artist that's the uh, that is the core of what I'm supposed to do is that I need to be credible. And if you feel that we were no, not, not credible not and I wasn't credible. About, I'm not talking about your performance. I'm, I, unfortunately, I'm talking about some of your co-stars. Um, and I'm talking about the physical staging. Right. I'm talking about some of the choices that were made. And I think that's the reason that we're seeing a difference in the tone of the reviews off-Broadway and on-Broadway, which were much more sympathetic off-Broadway. And when Why it came do you to think that is? Well, I think that the standard was different. I think people off-Broadway weren't expecting as much. Um, they were delighted to get what they got, which is you giving a, 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 an exciting performance um, and a story that is interesting and compelling um, and that was enough but once it comes to Broadway when the, where the tickets are higher where it's in this beautiful old theater which suggests a, a level of quality and professionalism in history I think that the uh, the bar was raised again let me say this when I teach I teach <clears throat> in, in New Haven over the summers I've taught at Cornell New York University I talk about being dead right or alive and wrong as an artist and I say when given the choice you can be right, but sometimes you'll be dead. So that does, that isn't my choice. I'd rather be alive and wrong. That is, you work inductively, and sometimes things don't track, but they work. This is just creative so, theater. So, so, Dan Gordon, I think, is a great storyteller. Certain critics took umbrage with his play crafting, from what I remember and could understand. I don't read all the reviews, and I don't live with the reviews, because we... we kill ourselves you have to get back on the horse yeah. but they took <clears throat> umbrage with the crafting of the play rather than the telling of the story in a way if there were a people's choice award in the new york theater arena's vow would win it there's no question about it because otherwise people wouldn't be showing up at the theater and they are moved and they stand i don't think it's a dutiful ovation you may be right adam you may be right you know i've come to broadway three times on the wings of critics and Golda's Balcony came from Manhattan Ensemble Theater on the wings of critics. Mm -hmm. Irena's Vow on the wings of critics. Yentl, the yeshiva boy, became Yentl on the wings of critics from BAM. And I've had two great successes before, and we're hoping that this will continue that tradition, despite the fact that there's been a lot of uh, critical, uh, um, let us say, disagreement. And let me tell you, in Adam's defense, when Golda's Balcony came from off-Broadway to Broadway, it got a different review in the Times. But we persevered. In Time Out, in your no, uh, in, your, in uh, the New York Times. Uh, but let me ask you though this <laughs> issue: this <laughs> issue though of dealing with in a larger scope here, because you have been in a number of plays, and uh, very famously, the miniseries Holocaust. Yes, which was incredibly inaccurate. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, about I that. Mean, what, it what, upset what, a lot of people. What is, what is the <clears throat> point, though? I mean, is the Holocaust an historic event, Adam? That 
can only be done justice to by a pure historical documentary form. Is there, should the Holocaust not in any way be used for uh, uh, narrative fiction? No, I think, that, I think it can be, certainly. I just think that you have to be very careful with it and you have to be very upfront about it. Um, this play for me fudges a lot of lines. Um, it uh, uses a lot of photographs and documentary evidence in the, in the staging uh, that suggests it's a docudrama, uh, that it suggests it's telling a, a very, and the marketing is all about how it's a true story. Uh, and it gives off that impression. Um, that's very much part of. But Adam Sweetheart, it, it is a true story, it it is, is, a, notwithstanding the infant. It is inspired by a true story. But also at the end, there's all these scenes. Roman comes knocking at her door in Los Angeles at the end, out of the blue. It's a, it's a scene that it is would be totally unbelievable in any context. And in this play, it's especially problematic because of the nature of it. That scene where, I, I don't know if it's true or not, it's not in the memoir, the scene where Irena uh, serves as a decoy for the SS after getting a brick through the wall, I, that, it's not in the memoir. Maybe it's something that, he told, that she told uh, Dan Gordon, I don't know. But it doesn't, these scenes don't seem real. And then the, the, the overall effect, uh, if you're a critical thinker leaving this play, is disbelief. And I think that that for a Holocaust drama, as distinct from other, you know, subject matter, that is a very dangerous reaction. Two things which mm -hmm. I suggest. According to Dan Gordon, who incidentally, for whatever it's worth, is the loveliest guy in the world. He He's seems a, like a fun guy. Very decent. Former member of the, of the Israeli army. You better watch out if you yeah. come across him. Adam. <laughs> He's a very kind man. He's a very good man. Anyway, he did not base his play on In My Hands. For the, many, the many, that he didn't base it on that. Right. He based it on tapes he has directly from her over 18 years. He had an 18 year relationship. And when she was dying and the first play reading was happening up in Connecticut, I was not part of it. He, she, from the hospital, he held the phone to Arena's, uh, to, to Arena to hear the applause in Connecticut. He was in Connecticut and they held the phone in her hospital room. And she said, Donny, Donny, after I die, who will tell my story? And Dan Gordon said, you will tell your story, Arena. You will tell it. And it's based on these many, many hours of tapes. And you've got nine and a half hours of the show Institute. So when you go to the show Institute, maybe more of this stuff that you're worried that is not documented will come up other well, than the Jennifer Armstrong uh, 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 autobiography that, that she helped Arena Goot. Pen and, right. and yeah, but no, but that's what I'm saying. I don't know if that story is false or not. It's not in the memoir, but it seems the presentation of it makes it seem false to me. And that's not just a question of whether it's falsified literally. It's a question of how it's written and the craftsmanship with which it's put across. Um, and I just I wasn't sold on the play. And I, you know, uh, I'm a, as I say, I'm a, I'm a I'm a longtime fan of your work. I reviewed you in Golda's Balcony very uh, positively, also in Tallulah Hallelujah, which I thought you were she wonderful. Did, yes. Um, yes. You know, I'm very pleased. Yeah, just USA Today said it was one of the ten best plays of the season. Yeah. Just wonderful. And you wrote that and, one. Yeah. I wrote it. Yeah. And so it's not a question of, of you or your work. It's a question of, of the play and how successful I feel it is. And I, I know that a lot of people are moved by it. And a, a number of my colleagues in the critical community really enjoyed the show. So there's a right. lot of disagreement on it. You can get it at a deeper point here. And this issue has been raised with the trials that have gone on in the last few years of former concentration camp guards. The, the, um, the lawyers who defend those people, when they talk about memory, memoirs, how do we know that the memories in the memoir themselves are accurate? How do well, we know that Irena's memoir is all that accurate? A lot of the these memoir, things happened a long time true. ago. A lot of it is clearly reconstructed. There's dialogue that it must be invented based on what her general memories are. Uh, there's also a few deliberate falsifications. I think we can say, such fairly. as you mean the such as she lies about her age in the memoir. Oh well, um, <laughs> by the well, way. no, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, you know uh, it's a, it's a venial just sin. Just you but wait, it, Adam Feldman. I know. <laughs> Just you white, just you white, white and you know. <laughs> uh, No, I know it's it's a small thing, except it, it, it contributes to it because the difference between being a 17-year-old or and 21 being a 21-year-old 21 matters, correct. and it, it, it matters for some of the stories that she's telling. It matters that she's already a nurse somehow when she's seven. You know, like things but that she, are that confusing. maybe she was in a she in a slow program. Right. That she only had done one year of nursing it's school. True, <laughs> but all these things make you make you wonder, Adam, and, I, and I don't want to wonder when I'm reading a Holocaust. Movie. I understand that, and as an artist. When I went to Kozienice, Poland, to research her life, if you don't think I was in a state of shock when the mayor of the town gave me her birth certificate and said 1918 and not 1922, mm. and I, like any good girl, had read, of course, this incredible book in my hands, mm. so she chopped four years off of her life. And I said, well, I need to do the play as a 17-year-old, not as a 21-year-old. Again, dead right or alive and wrong, because the character's intent 
mm -hmm. was that she was 17. Also, I was a 17 New York City, Westchester County kid. She was a 21-year-old rural Polish kid. Very different and mm -hmm. a devout Catholic. So also, I am neither 17 nor 21 nor 35. So I said, oh, you better go back to 17 to make it credible that you're a young kid and to make sure the difference between you and the 67-year-old major is very clear, mm. that it's like robbing a, a cradle. So that was an artistic choice. And yes, I was faced with the same conundrum as, as you were. But the question is, are these stories of value for the education of the human race? And the answer is yes. I think they are they as are. well. The stories are valuable. And the stories themselves are very compelling. And I recommend that people read this book. It's, it's very inspiring. Uh, and well, wait I, a minute. I, don't I recommend be, I don't that you to come be. to the play. <laughs> well, to the, play. Right. the question is, <laughs> what do you do with the story? And I'll tell you, I stayed afterwards for the Q&A because Irina Gudopdijk's daughter is uh, Jenny, is that her name? Jenny? Janina Opdijk-Smith. Janina Opdijk-Smith. Oh, and that's the other thing you should tell um, about that. Has been doing Q&As after mm -hmm. the uh, show, and the yeah. one I stayed for was very moving. But I, I was very surprised because it turns out that there are a lot of very interesting things about the story that aren't in the play. That's right. Um, in fact, more interesting things about the story than things that are in the play. And this, again, comes down to the question of how you take a story and shape it for the stage. And my job as a critic is to look at the work that was done on the story um, and, and what ended up on the stage. And the fact that these choices were made to put in some cases, banalities or, or falsifications on stage in lieu of much more interesting real-life complications involved, involved with this story, I think is telling about the way that this play was written, about the priorities of the play, and for me, why the play doesn't fully work and why it doesn't live up to the standard of the story that it's telling. Tova, we'll give you the last word. Well, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, in all honesty, my audience, my beloved Broadway audience, has known me for 36 years, which where I come from is double high, two lifetimes. And I try to only select, I'm great, grateful that I even can select, but I try to select plays of worth and people of worth. And just to come see Irena Gut's story in whatever melded memory form it might be, and I would say the percentage of that is very small in the play, though it is significant to Adam, and, and I respect that, is worth the journey. I would say seeing Irena's vow is not just an analytical experience, it's a very emotional experience, and you will be swept away by the possible heroism that you could engage in yourself, having watched an ordinary kid do extraordinary things under extraordinary circumstances. Excellent. Um, see for yourself, Irena's Vow at the Barrymore? Irena's Vow at the Walter Kerr Theater, Theater, 219 West 48th Street in New York City. <laughs> You're good. Tova Felcher, the star of the play, thank you very much for coming on. Adam, an interesting discussion. Adam Feldman from Time Out Magazine, thanks a lot. I cannot, I, I cannot do this. You have to, we have no choice. No choice? Is that what you think? Ida, is that what you think, that you have no choice? Do you want to have this baby? Of course. Of course, but the day are right. It would be too dangerous, wouldn't it? We've all discussed this, Arena. This is all about our decision. And with all due respect to your religion. No, you were right. This is not just a matter of religion. I saw a baby ripped out of its mother's arms. And it was murdered right in front of me. And you know what I did? I stood there. And I did nothing. I could do nothing. And I saw the mother of that baby. She was shot to death in front, in front of me. And I could do nothing. And I made a vow to God then and there that if ever I had the chance to save a life, save a life, I would do it. That's why I took you here to hide you without even thinking because of that vow. But I was wrong. You have taught me that. It's not enough just to save a life, to preserve a heartbeat, to merely survive. We have got to live, Laser. We got to, we got to live right in the face of death. Otherwise, the Hitlers and the Rokitas of this world have won, and they have turned us into what? What did you say? Huh? Rats! 
Two of our favorite guests on Theater Talk are the composer Mark Shaman and his lyric writing partner Scott Whitman. They're responsible for the smash hit Hairspray, and their new show, Catch Me If You Can, based on the Scorsese film, is about to open for a Broadway tryout in Seattle. A few years ago, Mark and Scott, and another favorite of ours, Bruce Valanche, were guests on Theater Talk, and Mark performed a number from Catch Me If You Can, which we're going to share with you right now. Speaking of new shows, <laughs> yeah. you guys have been working all summer on Catch Me, Catch Me If You Can, if you can yeah. right? The, uh, uh, an adaptation of the DreamWorks movie, was it? Uh, yeah, the, with Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, we're writing it with, um, I guess, we, yeah, Terrence yeah, McNally. Terrence McNally is McNally's doing the book. The book. Yeah. yeah. Don't you sort of start, though? See. Terrence McNally. <laughs> See? That the only hack. winner. Pulitzer Prize winner. See? This is what I'm in a house dress. Terrence McNally's writing the big musical. They didn't even approach you, Bruce? Questions answer themselves. They didn't approach me? I said, catch me if you can. <laughs> no, they didn't approach me. Terrence McNally was standing in front of me. Yeah. So this is kind of, kind of a 60s... Yeah, who who would have think that we would uh, write a 60s yeah. musical? But luckily, Catch Me If You Can offers us a whole other side of the 60s. The more Henry Mancini... Uh, the you know, the Rat Pack, feel to it. Rat that Man. was really kind of hitting its peak before it became um, cheesy and the kind of thing that kind of turned a generation off of that kind of style. But Catch Me If You Can will hopefully bring back when those Frank Sinatra and Judy Garland specials were really good with those... Um, Cigarettes. You know, the sets, those <laughs> cigarettes. Uh, what's the word with the sets? The Suggestions. Yeah. I think it's a great, er, uh, a great world for you to be writing <laughs> because it strikes me that all of you, in what you've written and the kind of shows that you've been involved in, you all have been influenced by those Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, Dean yeah. Martin, uh, 50s kind of special. I mean, your writing has that sort of easygoing uh -huh. feel to it. Is that mm -hmm. fair? Show business. Yeah, it's a show know, business. Yeah, that's good a old fashioned. Show, show business. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whiskey. Yeah. Yeah, whiskey. That too. <laughs> Hello. So, so I mean, you know, let, take us take us back, Mark, if you will, to the heyday of. Those I hope I remember of, the lyric. <laughs> the heyday of those Dean Martin specials. Well, um, I did bring a song to sing, if 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 I may. <laughs> you know, Christopher Walken is so fantastic in the, in the movie. movie. Yeah. So, you know, before we actually had a book writer, which we swore we wouldn't do because what we did on Hairspray, and then you end up having songs that you have to sort of shoehorn a bit into the new plot or concept of the show. But I always think it's show. important to see if we can write in the vocabulary of this thing. You're trying to do this without a book writer. Well, well, no, just try to write something for one of the characters in the, in, you know, before Terrence had come on board. So. And so uh, this scene, well, there's a scene in the movie where Christopher Walken brings uh, his son, Frank, Frankie, Frank Jr., um, a checkbook for his birthday. And there's not much money in the bank. And so, oh, I guess that's... Uh, so you got to imagine, imagine I'm Christopher Walken. <laughs> and imagine that Frank Jr., when Christopher Walken sings to him, it's, you know, it's what he sees on TV. He idolizes his father. And, and so the kid, well, hit it back there. <laughs> so the kid says, Dad, what am I going to do with a blank checkbook? And his father says, ah, oh, ye have little faith. <laughs> Fifty checks don't feel like much when you first hold. Them. Nothing special to the touch of, ah, but look inside. Every digit points the way. Every date's your lucky day. Every check's a mini magic carpet ride. It's like Playboy after dark here. Can you think of 50 dreams? They're in your hand now And with your heart and mind There ain't nothing you can do Cause you have 50 choices 50 chances Cold hard cash or hot romances 50 checks can make those dreams come true 50 checks don't feel like much, but listen, Frankie, where's that camera? In the proper hands, there's such a work of art, and every one of them unlocks your own personal Fort Knox, even Rock.
Rockefeller had to get his start. Use that do re me to set your future singing. I wish I knew. Oh. You may strike it rich or just find strain and strife or a wife. On those 50 chances, 50 choices, buy little gifts like big Rolls Royces. 50 checks can make you change your life. I meant help you change your life. What the hell? Oh, I've arrived. Each check announces each one gold until it bounces. 50 checks, the ride has just begun. Hey, happy birthday to my wife.